it's moving large stones and people are pretty capable of doing that i mean i've had to see people do that on archaeological sites you know we excavate out you know a several ton in marble inscription and we got to get it out of the trench and you know the the local work uh men and, and women that do this on a regular basis they know how to do this you know it's just ropes and 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 you know muscle power and you know they're moving a multi-ton inscription i couldn't freaking do it i wouldn't mm -hmm. even know the first get bet but they know how to lever it and they know how to you know get it to to shift on off its axis to get it start walking it out of a trench and then to pull it up with a series of ropes some people pushing some people pulling you get enough muscle power you can move several ton stones i've seen people do this i always find this funny when people are like archaeologists don't know this stuff they're not like stone masons or something like that they've never seen how to move large stones and it's like how do you think all those large stones you see lying around an archaeological site when you go visit the Giza or the Acropolis in Athens or wherever, you see many ton stones sitting around, usually in stone piles. Those were probably moved in the 19th century, most of them by hand by people, by a crew of workers using nothing more than muscle power. And I've seen it with my own eyes, people moving several ton large stones. I've even helped out on a rope. You know, I've never been in charge of moving one, but I've helped out on a rope. And right. so it's just like, this idea that it's something so impossible, just it makes no sense. And we, we, we have to move these stones all the time when we encounter one in an archaeological site and we need to get it out of the way. You know, I, I don't know how else to put it. That's what we have to do. And so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. As far as Graham Hancock's position goes, he kind of admitted we don't have any evidence of that advanced civilization now on this episode, though... He goes through an entire Netflix series and written many books, making the statement that we have this evidence. I, I, I know that because I've seen people who've quoted his book on Twitter. They're showing the references and stuff where he made bold claims. seems like he's backpedaling. But my question is, what evidence do we have, again, for civilizations around the time they're claiming an advanced one exists? It's just hunter-gatherers? Yeah, at that time, so they're claiming in the Ice Age, all we have is hunter-gatherers all around the world. We have thousands and thousands of sites. You know, I mean, I think I showed the Paleolithic Radiocarbon Database of Europe, which stretches all the way to Siberia, has something like 13,000 sites in it. And so from the Ice Age, and they're all hunter-gatherer locales. And so it's just, it's, 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 you know, we have so much evidence for hunter-gatherers. We have it in the places that he says we're not looking. We have, you know, hunter-gatherer sites in the Amazon from that period. We have hunter-gatherer sites in the Sahara from that period. We have hunter-gatherer sites from the coastlines of that period. And we have hunter-gatherer sites that we found underwater from that period. You know, time and time again, we have these sites. And so that's what we have. I mean, I tend to think that civilization is a misnomer. We don't really use that term very frequently in archaeology anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just something that too many people have defined in too many ways. So it's become kind of meaningless. And so we've kind of learned that things like agriculture, sedentism, urbanism, working with larger architecture, all these things advance and change, I should say, advance is even a misnomer, at, separately in different regions at different times if you see what I mean. So it's not right. like there's some sort of complete package. Once they sort of all occur together in the in the Middle East, in the Southwest Asia, then they move with people as a package that we call the Neolithic package. But, you know, the development of each of those different technologies and phenomena in Southwest Asia sort of happens independently. Same what thing in Mesoamerica, South America, um, East Asia, et cetera. And so, you know, in different areas of domestication and sedentism and urbanism and, you know, different ways of working in stone. And so, you know, this idea of civilization, that's that that's why we see it as a misnomer. Too often what we do is it, what people in the past did, archaeologists and scholars, is they drew this line between civilization and primitive savages. And, you know, that that idea is not how we think of hunter gatherers either. What we've learned is that hunter gatherers are actually fairly complex. You know, they're doing some quite amazing things to survive and thrive in tough landscapes and sometimes not in tough landscapes. And when they're when they are surviving and thriving, at times they're building fantastic large monuments like at Gobekli Tepe. And so, you know, we see hunter gatherers have this kind of know how. And so there's no reason to assume that you know, they're not civilized, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you about Gobekli Tepe, as it, it really was a shocker as people started discovering when this was being, this structure was made. Uh, the question I have is, do 
do we have anything that goes way further back that is stone monuments of some sort or at least resembling this kind of building structure from hunter gatherers and then if we don't would it be a shock to discover that we maybe there are some structures similar to like what we see with Glebaki Tepe going back three, four thousand years before that into the Ice Age area or, or time frame? Yeah. So, um, well, first off, with Glebaki Tepe, it's actually less of a shock than I don't know that everybody on YouTube makes it out to be. Yeah, we, um, we do. You know, yeah. I, I, I actually wonder if this comes from Graham Hancock treating right. it so magnanimously. I mean, a little bit from the excavators, they trumpeted it, and it was an amazing find. I'm not trying to say that it's not a super cool site, but what it has is monumental architecture, and we'd already discovered monumental architecture from the same time period nearby. So, you know, you have... Uh, Ah, what about what, Tell us Sultan uh, Jericho, also known as Jericho. Kathleen Kenyon excavated that in the 1960s from the exact same time period as Gobekli Tepe. There we actually have agriculturalists, sedentary people, unlike Gobekli Tepe where there's hunter-gatherers. And there there's monumental architecture. It's a different kind of style, but they have an enormous tower there and uh, parts of the wall and stuff like that that are, you know, extremely monumental. Um, and just as large and impressive as Gobekli Tepe. And similarly, this kind of T-shaped megalithic structures, Gobekli Tepe was not the first one found. Klaus Schmidt, who excavated it, Gobekli Tepe, previously excavated Nevali, Nevali Chori, and which, had, which is also, I, I think, hunter-gatherers with the same type of monumental architecture. It dates a little later than Gobekli Tepe, but it's, it's just a little bit later, like a few hundred years, and, and it's the same style and everything. It's just not, it wasn't as impressively complete. If you see right. what I mean, it was so we had it there. We could reconstruct it in our mind's eye, but uh, it was not as complete and, and impressive looking as Gobekli Tepe, and that's part of what makes it so uh, so impressive. Is 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 it, it stands out in the eyes? If you see what I mean, and that's good for showing right. what it is. Um, we definitely, and so in that situation, even in the same area, we have clear evidence of for thousands of years before Gobekli Tepe of the Natufian culture. Uh, starting to live semi-sedentary uh, lives, hunter-gatherers, they're not agriculturalists, but they're starting to sort of play with cultivating plants. So they're sort of helping them out, but they're not actually harvesting them and then planting them, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, but, they're, but, they're, but they're, you know, trying to help them out in, in different ways, um, sometimes with fire, sometimes in other sorts of ways. And so we know that they're harvesting these wild plants intensively. They're storing them even so that they can be consumed over months and, and maybe even future years. They're grinding them and processing them intensively, just like at Gobekli Tepe. And they're, they're also starting to build more larger and larger structures. They're not as impressive as Gobekli Tepe, but they show the development in that region of different sort of architectural skills and know-how, uh, if you see what I mean. But most of their structures were sort of more uh, for storage, um, things like that, less uh, this kind of ceremonial type uh, structures that, that sort of stand out, like the tower at Jericho or like the enclosures at Gobekli Tepe. Yeah. Is it safe to say that the time on their hands to build structures like that is due to them knowing how to store more food to be able to eat more because they're not preoccupied with every single day, nine to nine, not no nine to five, nine to nine <laughs> or five to whenever it's dark hunting to get food. They find better ways to reserve it, store it, and now they have a little more time in their hands to do other activities. Yeah, I think so. I mean, in that area in particular, the, these different groups of people had found very successful niches. So, you know, at Gobekli Tepe, they found this niche where, you know, in the spring, they come up there when the weather starts getting nice from the lowlands to the uplands. And at that time, the, the grain is ready to harvest. It would have been harvestable earlier in the lowlands, if you see what I mean, because it's warmer. Mm -hmm. And so they, they come to the uplands and it's a staggered harvest, therefore, of this kind of wild wheat that's growing. And then you wait a few months, they store that, that, that wild wheat, they grind it, they might ferment it into beer, they might turn it into porridge, that kind of stuff is the evidence we have. And then uh, a few months later, the, uh, the gazelle come through the pass. And so we can tell exactly what month they're coming through from the isotopic signatures and the kill-off patterns that zooarchaeologists have studied. And so we, we actually can therefore tell when they're up there. They're up there for the warm 
parts of the season. So they're moving sort of seasonally between the uh, the lowlands in the colder seasons and then the uplands in the warmer seasons um, to wow. exploit these different niches. And then while they're there, they have plentiful time. They harvest that wheat. It stores. They're waiting for those gazelle to come through. And so right nearby is the quarries for it, the, that they get the stone to build Gabatli Tepe and they have time on their hands. And, you know, they do this. They, they follow this seasonal way of life for it's over a thousand years at that site. You know, so you think about it from today to like, you know, what, the end of the Roman Empire, right? That's the right. amount of time, I think even longer, that they're at this site. And so, you know, it's so much time to be able to uh, develop this kind of ceremonial center. And then, of course, you know, the, the team is now starting to excavate further away from the ceremonial center. And, and Graham says, oh, my God, the, the, the older buildings are nicer than the next buildings. And it's like that's because this is the ceremonial center. And then the other buildings are just where they're living and where they're grinding their grain and storing their grain. And, of course, you know, you go to any city and you have a ceremonial center that's built, you know, like in Washington, D.C. in the 19th century. And then you have other areas built in the 20th century that aren't as grand as what we built in the 19th century. And that doesn't mean our technology is more inferior. You know, it's because that that's when that ceremonial uh, center was constructed and they maintained it, if you see what I mean. There was no reason to update it. Um, and so, I mean, that happens all the time in different cities and settlements uh, throughout the world. That's <laughs> so, exactly yeah. what I was going to mention because I know – there are friends of mine who are into this alternative stuff who think that look at the look at the stones under civilizations yeah. that come later, massive stones. I, for example, the Herodian aspect of the of the Jewish temple and remnants that are left of it, those stones are massive. The Herodian yeah. stones are massive. Then you can go to the later civilizations who built on it stacking smaller blocks and you go, well, it's an inferior build compared to Herodians. The, and it's uh, actually the opposite, probably. You know, you look at sort of cultures and technology over time. We've always gone from sort of larger things to smaller, more modular things. And you can see that today we're building with concrete, right? You know, where it's it's it's, it's become dust that we can manipulate however you want. It, building with smaller stones and mortar and things like that is actually going to be more sturdy. It's going to be more easy to repair over time. And so, you know, this idea of larger stones is more superior technology. It's actually the exact opposite. Everywhere wow. you look, it goes from kind of larger stones to smaller stones because smaller stones are, are more efficient and, and more repairable and they're more sturdy, you know? And so this, this, this misnomer that, I don't know. These people sell as if large stones somehow mean superior technology. And I just don't get it. If everywhere you look, it's the exact opposite. You know, that's, that's I, the I know in mistake. Egypt, according to uh, Dr. Cooney in Egypt, the, the initial dynasties are building these magnificent pyramids. And then, you know, the argument they'll usually make is look at these raunchy little half ass pyramids that come later. Um, they, they must've lost this secret, technology again right this kind of argumentation <laughs> and she's like it, it's her opinion and i suspect other uh egyptologists who say actually what's going on is they already have their dynasty established here's this massive ass you know constructions we don't need to like compete with that we'll make our own little like here's my little pyramid yeah. that represents me and my kingdom but like these are already magnificently done. We don't need to keep making this kind of structure. It's already happened. And how much money, time, and energy that went into that, it almost became a way to, this symbolizes my dynasty and my ruling as well. Even though they were initially used for initial pharaohs, another way of putting it is, this is a little more complex, but in biblical literature, you had this back when the kings ruled and the gods ordained the kings to be in power. It wasn't just Bible. We're talking Mesopotamia, Assyria, Babylon. The gods gave the kings the rights, and it was always like, this is God given to the kings. Later, when there were no more kings in the Judean uh, regions, the scribes take that authority that was once a kingly thing and mm -hmm. attribute it to themselves. Well, in ancient Egypt, you could say later kings, later pharaohs, are just taking the earlier clout that comes from these massive structures and applying it to themselves and saying, do I, do I really need to go and build that again? I mean, it's already there. And, 
You know what I mean? And you know, look, look, styles and attitudes change. You could look at the development of phones over time. And they're initially these massive fucking things. And then eventually they become smaller and smaller. Then we get the touch screen and now they become bigger again because there's you know, it's 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 style and fads. You can see this with cars, you know, there's the big, big cars, but then you get a sports car and it's a tiny little thing. You know, the size and stuff like that. They, they, the the styles change what people do to impress other people people changes over time there's no reason to think that you know the only way to express power is through having the largest monument you know there's so many different ways to express your status and your power and your wealth and sometimes it's through very small things in subtle ways others times it's through something more in your face and it's just sort of you know I, I don't understand why we think there's only one way to do something that's more impressive than another it's it's a very reductive way of thinking about our ancestors yeah the the final point I'd like to make is I've engaged with many people online from various stripes. And oftentimes there's this accusation of people like me, I call myself an atheist, um, who say, you know, they want to put the burden of proof on me. And many atheists online go, well, we we don't we're not the ones who ha who have to bear the burden. You you need to prove the existence of this omniscient, omnibenevolent, you know, the, the arguments. I'm sure you've seen them online. Everyone has come across this stuff. Mm -hmm. But in your case, it's a special kind of position, in my opinion. I could make a case, a strong, positive case against the existence of Yahweh, which I have done in a recent documentary I just launched. In this case of archaeology, they want to shift, you, you know, you could easily just shift the burden and say, you need to prove it exists. You haven't done that. And he wants to do this God of the gaps kind of thing where it's like, you know, it's out there. You just haven't found it yet. Wishful thinking, hopeful, all of that. Is there evidence in your mind that isn't just shifting it back to them for them to carry the burden, but you think is definitive evidence that proves the case that we don't have these advanced civilizations? I thought I mentioned you, I thought you mentioned something about ships being in yeah. the water. Things so that prove. Yeah, there's a range of things. I mean, look, so I didn't really treat this as a debate. I taught it, taught it more as a classroom largest classroom I could ever have, right? You know, I'm there, I get a chance to actually teach what I do. And so that's, that was my real goal. It wasn't even, and, 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 you know, the, 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 the idea of having to disprove his ideas, which, you know, are never published in a sort of scientific way. So there's no reason to critique them in that kind of way. As I mentioned, I mean, look, he's very honest about being biased. He even has this blog uh, on his website saying he, he doesn't, he's not, he, he thinks of himself as a, as an attorney, a lawyer with his client being this lost civilization. And he wants to present this theory in the best light possible. So of course he's going to be selective about his evidence, if you see what I mean. And yeah. so as, as I showed with those Ed Food texts, he's extremely selective putting together those sentences from different pages. And so I, I really saw this as, look, if, uh, there's no way to really debate somebody who's just categorically opposed to, you know, looking at archaeology in the way that scholars look at archaeology. And so I really used it as kind of a, an example to really teach archaeology to a large audience. And of course, I framed it around the topic of the conversation, which was, is there this lost civilization? And yeah, I definitely think there's strong archaeological evidence against it. I mean, this is why I'm writing this book and, and I'm going to be YouTubing more about this topic is because, you know, this, this idea was considered seriously in scholarship in the 19th century and sort of discarded. But at this point, we have so much more evidence, mm. especially the last, you know, 50, 70, 100 years in many countries where cultural heritage laws have been put into place. And the public just does not quite understand the scale of archaeological evidence that we have. I mean, you know, so... You, Graham Hancock claims there's this global civilization and he says it's, you know, underwater because of sea level rise at the end of the ice age. And he critiques underwater archaeology because they've uncovered, you know, thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of shipwrecks. And he says, but you're not finding many settlements. So you're, you're doing the wrong thing. If you want to test my hypothesis, you should, you should be looking for settlements underwater for ice age stuff underwater. And it's sort of like, wait a second, hold on, Graham. You're trying to say this is a, a global civilization where there's trade across the oceans and across the seas. Where are your shipwrecks? If we're focused on finding shipwrecks, well, there should be shipwrecks from your civilization. You know, this is just a no brainer. If yeah. we know how to find shipwrecks and we're so successful at finding them from all the different periods where humans have ships, well, 
what the heck, where are yours, you know? And so yeah. that was one of my big ones. The other one was just to focus on all the coastal evidence we have and even the underwater evidence we have from the Ice Age, the stuff in the Sahara, the tens and thousands, hundreds of thousands of sites and millions of artifacts around the world and just say, look, we're, we are able to predict, you know, by looking at the geology of the landscape for areas to survey for Stone Age finds because we know there there's exposed Stone Age soils due to erosion, due to uplift, due to different kinds of things. And we go there and we look and we find Stone Age stuff all the time, whether it's coastlands, whether it's in forests, whether it's in deserts. And we find this stuff and we're targeting this stuff. We're looking for it. But your stuff ain't there. And then third of all, as I brought up for uh, in the middle, I think, of the conversation is domestication. 